Please are in listen only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to our second interactive e-journal presentation of 2021. My name is Katia Rezai and I will be moderating this session, albeit mostly in a silent mode, I'll be moderating. Uh, I'm very grateful to our very capable panelists today that uh, will be discussing a very timely topic of educating the next generation of cytology professional in the midst of a global pandemic. In pathology in general, and most specifically in cytology, morphologic examination is the basis of all the great things that we bring to the patient care uh, and beyond that. Uh, and therefore, the lockdown that was caused by the pandemic uh, caused a lot of problem for this flow of educational uh, activities. And today, we are, uh, our panelists are going to be discussing on how effectively and successfully we can um, plan on doing so um, to make sure that the education tr trend does not stop. Without further ado, I will turn to our panelists who will introduce themselves and uh, let us learn from their collective experiences. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Susan Elberstein. I'm a supervisor of the Papanicolaou Lab of Cytology at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell. And I'm a part of the uh, JASC e-journal committee. And normally in the past, we would take an article and they're still on the website. You can check out the e-journal website on the ASC. We review the, review the journals. We ask questions. Um, there's a lot of learning going, going on. And it's... Um, all on the website. What we decided to do was that we would do a live recording, sort of an interactive type of method. Um, rather than just giving my input, I'm happy to share the input with the panelists. And I'm also encouraging you, the audience, to please enter into the chat. We'd love to hear your experiences. Um, this is primarily about an educational institutional experience, the paper, but we all have, if you have a teaching hospital, if you have to complete your educational requirements, Please let us know your best practices and we'll share ours with you as well. So the article was um, titled Learning Cytology in the Times of the Pandemic, an Educational Institutional Experience with Remote Teaching. Um, it was written by Paul Chow and I'm pleased to um, have Paul Chow with us now. Uh, Paul, would you please um, introduce yourself? Sure, so I'm Paul and um, I'm a cytology uh, educator as well as faculty at uh, Rutgers University um, at the Newark campus. Uh, we um, educate the uh, master's level cytology students um, and uh, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you and we're also happy to have Sean McNair. Sean would you like to introduce yourself? Yes hi everyone How, uh, I'm Sean McNair I'm actually the cytology education coordinator at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and I'm also the program director for the Hunter College Advanced Certificate in Cytotechnology program and we, I'm happy to definitely uh, discuss my experience in the pandemic as well. So I want to thank you guys both for participating in this panel but also for continuing your program and not having any interruptions during the pandemic. It was important to the students to finish. It's important to our field that we adapt and resilience, which um, I acknowledge that both of you have done and, and thank you. Um, the objectives of the paper were to discuss the evolving changes of remote online learning technology in response to the onset of the pandemic. They also compared and analyzed the finding of the cytology students' experiences with adapting to this online experience. And the paper also reviewed technology platforms on guiding the training educational resources of cytotechnologists. So I'm, we're gonna go over some of our best practices and what we learned, but I encourage you to all enter into the chat and um, share your experiences as well. We'd love to hear from students from that year. Um, let us know how you're doing and how we can help in the future. So can you believe it's actually a year to the day, right? We were told two weeks, stay inside, flatten the curve. Well, as you all know, two weeks became two months, which quickly became two. Um, we're still um, suffering from the global pandemic. Um, I would like you guys to just sort of share with you me a brief experience of what that must have been like um, at the time. When, for example, did you hear about the 
this sheltering in place? Was that in the beginning, the middle, or the end of your program? And how long approximately did it take for you guys to get back up running and, and meet in person, or did that never really happen? Um, Paul, we could start with you. Uh, sure. Um, so we, the, um, at the time, uh, we were towards the end of our cytology uh, curriculum, and, um, and there were a lot of confusion. I think, as all of you remember, um, information moved very rapidly at the time, um, albeit sort of um, not organized way sometimes. Uh, just to illustrate, um, we were actually supposed to have a um, high school outreach uh, activity um, where we um, go out to an indoor um, gymnasium um, where um, high school students from around the neighborhood would be bus in uh, hundreds and if not thousands of them uh, in an indoor gathering. Um, it was abruptly canceled just two days before the, the event were to take place. Um, so without any warnings whatsoever. And, uh, and likewise, the campus uh, closure uh, was announced and proceed with the same type of abruptness, if you will. Um, there were very, very little warnings, um, very little um, heads up. And so a lot of, you know, my colleagues, um, a lot of people I've talked to, um, they, they were not sure um, um, of how to proceed, especially with teaching um, uh, morphology um, aspect of, of the cytotechnologies edu education. Um, and, and that was one of the impetus for me writing this article um, to share um, with, with colleagues and others and to start a conversation um, about remote teaching experiences um, and, and, um, and hopefully, you know, we can all hear from each other's best practices and, and, uh, and improve upon those. Thank you. And Sean, would you like to share a little bit what it must have been like? And, and just a reminder, um, students were not, no, no one but essential personnel, not even patient visitors were allowed to come to the institutions. So um, students, I don't even think were able to empty their desks, correct? Well, we were lucky to have a, a slightly different experience at Memorial. Uh, I know that around the first week of the pandemic, I mean, it was it was chaos. Essentially, it was as chaotic as you could think. Uh, for our program, we were right in the middle of training. So I think we had just started body cavity fluid cytology. So urine and um, effusion cytology. And the students, you know, were just starting to rotate on, you know, different biopsies, et cetera, et cetera. We were really getting into a groove. We were lucky that we had finished most of the gynecologic training. Uh, however, you know, I think we also had clinical rotations planned. We had clinical rotations scheduled. And, you know, suddenly everything started to become canceled. We were lucky that students were able to continue studying at MSK. However, w what needed to happen is that we had to ensure social distancing and then we also couldn't do any double scoping. So students were able to come to MSK, you know, individually or in smaller groups to do individual microscopic work. But essentially, um, this all had to be reconfigured in a few weeks. So there were a, a good one or two weeks where students were not coming at all. Uh, we switched all lectures to Zoom um, very quickly, you know, as we got licenses for the software. And uh, I just remember March through April being <laughs> very, 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 very difficult. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah. uh, it was an experience. Yes, it was really was an experience. Um, this is just a photograph of what we were like. For, we, we're not, a, we don't have a school in NYP, but we do have, in New York State, you have to have 24 hours of continuing education. We are a teaching hospital with residents. And our... Um, our cytotechnicians have to fulfill 12 hours of continuing education. So we have pre-pandemic, we had a set schedule. Wednesday at one o'clock at noon, we would have our conference. Um, you can see here, this is a multi-head session. With, we do have monitors on the walls, but you can clearly see um, that there's no room for social distancing here um, at this, um, this meeting. So, and, and invariably what we found was as you all know, like I'm sure how many times has this happened, we'd 
we'd show a, 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 continue, a lecture and in the middle of the lecture, somebody, one or two people would be called out for rows. You had to stop, you know, you, you didn't get to be able to finish the lecture. So now we're recording all of our lectures and we're offering that flexibility that teaching can be done at any time, particularly our site of technician staff. They come in the evening and nights, so they can also um, participate in some of our lectures. So um, we found this to be one area where um, the change was actually better. Um, we don't meet in small groups, which is too bad and unfortunate, and hopefully we can do that again, but at least our continuing education um, can change and go forward. Um, in the paper, um, Paul, you talk about the lectures being shared by PowerPoint using Zoom. And I think that we can all agree at this point that this is the best way to share lectures. Um, you talked a little bit about some educational resources. And you did mention that your students were able to bring microscopes home and bring slide packets, which is really, I think, um, key. I don't, I don't think in our institution you're not allowed to bring anything off site but at least your students did have that ability to deal with the morphology challenge. Um, this is just um, to share with you one of the sites you talk about in the paper, cytologystuff.com. Hologic has a lot of free services out there. These are enhancement services, not to replace education, but to enhance learning. And they have a very good manual um, a library database of cases that you can go over with some self-assessments. Um, the ASC, I just want to say thank you with the ASC for all the webinars, all the databases, all the library work. Um, these are all great tools for you to all use to enhance your learning education. Um, Paul, are there any other websites or any other um, digital areas that you can talk about that you used? Sure, I, I think um, there are also other interactive um, uh, websites, um, for example, Hologic, um, they have uh, interactive um, um, interactive uh, slide sets where um, students can go in, and these slides are already imaged, and um, and you can um, from from the click of a mouse kind of simulate sort of the, the screening that you do um, on a regular microscope. Um, and and um, other than Hologic, um, IAC. Uh, International um, Academy of Cytology. They also have uh, very, very interactive um, 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 materials um, and websites. You can you can go on. Uh, we utilize uh, both uh, for our um, for our uh, remote teaching. That's great. And Sean, can you add anything to that? Or absolutely. Uh, some of the most, a lot of the resources that I chose uh, to utilize during. The, um, the initial shutdown were actually from the ASC. I thought that the ASC did an amazing job of just, you know, um, aggregating our expertise and also, you know, um, using resources. Uh, Donald Russell actually did provide a virtual microscopy session and there were a few virtual sessions and slide, um, slide materials from Hologic, um, you know, their digital cytology education, which was also utilized to um, um, give students quizzes at home. I thought that was great for them to be able to do GYN quizzes at home, as well as uh, we also did unknowns and we used Zoom to do breakout rooms. So that was, I thought that was really cool. So we actually put the students in breakout rooms and said, we're going to do, um, you know, two students in one room, another two students in another room, and then they would come up with differentials or the diagnoses on these virtual unknowns as we were going through the whole slide viewer. So, I mean, this was all happening real time where we were learning the technology, but also, you know, using it as a teaching tool. And I will say that the students, the feedback was we're at home, but we don't feel abandoned. We don't feel that, you know, you guys just, just said, well, we can't do this when, you know, with clinical education, the um, one thing, Paul, I will add here is that New York State um, basically did give guidance. The New York State Department of Education gave guidance to our program that, you know, even in times of COVID, you still had to be sure that students had sufficient clinical hours. And if we were going to substitute clinical hours for virtual sessions, we actually had to um, file for approval to, to do this. 
So it was very important in terms of the regulatory aspect of this as well to be sure that we were staying in touch with New York State and making sure that they knew what modifications we were making to our program. And, you know, they had to essentially approve them afterwards. Yeah, thank you for that, um, being flexible and adapting. Um, and yes, we enjoyed the ASC webinars. I mean, it, it was great. It was like, you felt comfort tuning into those. You felt like we were sort of a community all bonding over these webinars. We listened to every one of them. We really appreciated those. Um, and even the ASC meeting became online and that was terrific. And I think maybe it met more people's needs who maybe couldn't travel or couldn't afford to travel. It was a great um, option for people um, to be able to log in um, from home. And again, we didn't cancel the meeting, it continued. Um, so in your paper, um, Paul, you talk about um, telepathology systems and whole slide imaging systems while excellent tools were not utilized and typically they're not utilized across the country um, basically because of the high cost is a limiting factor. At New York Presbyterian, uh, we use spot imaging for our telepathology system. It is a great system for taking images from remote locations like radiology and the OR and bringing them back to the pathology suite and the pathologist can do rows um, very accurately. And, and But however, for teaching, we wouldn't take that from those sites because they're de definitely designated for those um, activities. In terms of digital slide, whole slide imaging, we do have a Perio and we do, again, it's very expensive. We share it with the larger anatomic pathology. We basically use our Perio for slides that are case, again, the imaging is great now on these. They have the Z stack down, they know what they're doing. The um, morphology is terrific on, the, uh, on, on our Perio anyway. Uh, we share it and we only scan those cases that are going out for consultation or for second slide requests so that we have those images. We do take sometimes some of those images from those slides. We, we can present them for a tumor board or a conference if someone needed to review them and the slides mm -hmm. weren't available. I suppose you could use some of those images for screening, like digital screening, but it's clearly not going to replace any type of traditional screening on a multi-scope. So digital screening is the way of the future, but it's not right now. So I think while that could be used in those those instances, there's, there's a great, you can have a great library database in them. Um, we, we don't use that for those purposes. Do you, um, either of you, Paul, do you use um, any of these systems? Um, at the time, we, um, we didn't have the uh, um, uh, image scanner. Um, we have since purchased one. But I think even if we had um, um, a, a whole slide image scanner at the time, um, it would have been difficult to adapt just because you need an, um, you know, uh, to build up a slide library, image slide library, it takes time. Right. Um, it takes, you know, a lot of people, you, you know, you, you, you just can't do it over a, a few days of notice um, and, and move everything online. It, it, it was just, right. um, um, very challenging time at it, uh, back last month. Yeah, and um, also just to add a note there too, you can't, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, we need to talk about HIPAA and having a firewall and, and on our Perio scan, we can't really show those images in, a, in someone's house. So, you know, on site, we can look at these digital libraries, but looking them for students to look at them in their homes, I don't, I don't know if that would be feasible because there's patient information on them. Whereas study sets are, you know, are a little bit different story. But Sean, can you talk talk a little bit about these systems and whether you use um, use them or not for teaching? Uh, absolutely. So uh, we have been undergoing an initiative to a digital pathology uh, pathology initiative here at MSK. And actually one of the more useful things that I actually have been doing with my students is um, we are, uh, most of our uh, surgical biopsies are actually scanned real time. Um, so we're able to evaluate the core biopsies along with the cytology without having to physically pull the slide from surge path or, you know, take it while it's in clinical work. And we've been using it to evaluate past 
past cases that have biopsy correlation, such as cervical biopsies, uh, lung biopsies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this has been a very helpful tool to uh, help the students with cytohistocorrelation and also, you know, that real-time cytohistocorrelation, which is something we have to do at times. Hey, I have a case on my desk. I'm not sure, you know, which way to go, but can we look at the biopsy real-time to kind of correlate with histology? Um, along with that, we are absolutely um, developing a digital uh, cytology library as well. You are right about the HIPAA component, but we do have a path presenter library with um, whole slide image cases that are de-identified, which we can log in and use from anywhere. Uh, so that has been really useful for teaching and also uh, for students to access and to even annotate images, add them to your lectures, add them to social media if needed, you know. Uh, and um, I think that those things have been very, very helpful tools. The last thing I wanted to mention is the explosion of social media, the informal learning that happens with social media. I've convinced my students, join Twitter, and if you're on it, follow some of us, right? Because you're going to start seeing some of the things that we're talking about and teaching. And some attending pathologists have even said, I have seen better examples of cases than I saw in my entire training on Twitter. You know, there, or there's just things that I just don't see in my daily practice that, you know, I'm able to say, well, this is the best example of this criteria, you know, um, and I think that it's been a nice, a small tool, which has really gained prominence within the last two years or so to really help the students say, I can just observe and scroll the timeline and see what my colleagues are posting and what examples they're posting. And I can use this as an informal learning tool. So I think we definitely have the resources. Oh, the ASC hey. is on Twitter, so that's hey. great. And I think that you bring up a really good point. Um, social networking has become stronger than ever because we can meet in person. And one of the shortcomings that we were going to talk about is in the inability to network. If you're if you're learning from home, you don't have that group dynamic and network ability that you have as a great tool in social media. So that's another benefit that you can use um, to get on, on these websites. Um, Paul, I just want to move on to what you did talk about in your paper, a great um, tool that I hadn't heard of um, that you use to share for your teaching. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your technology. Sure, sure. So to teach morphology, you really can't get away from multi-head sessions, right? That, that's just the bread and butter of uh, the core of how we teach. Um, and the advantage of the approach that I described in the paper uh, was that, you know, it could be implemented relatively fast, almost overnight, uh, without burning a hole in your in your uh, budget. Um, and and the, to use this, it's basically just a mobile phone adapter. Um, and it costs somewhere around $25 on the lower end to maybe $100 if you were getting something on the uh, uh, higher end, um, as opposed to say a fly scanner, which could be 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand dollars um, to start off. So, so the, the, the approach that I described is basically connecting uh, the adapter onto the eyepiece of the microscope, as you see on the uh, left-hand side of the image there. Um, and, then, and then you can snap on your mobile phone uh, in my case, it was an iPhone. I snap it on, um, and and that's it. You're done. You know, very little, very little um, expertise involved. You know, it's it's easy snapping on, and you can use Zoom. Uh, you turn on your Zoom, and uh, or other apps. We we use Zoom for our experience, um, and the front camera. You could use it to talk to the students uh, that are remote, um, introducing introduce the, the the lecture to set things off and. Uh, in in in, um, in an organized way, um, and then the rear camera you can use it to share um, whatever you want to share on the on the you know uh, on the slides. So as you're you know on the right hand side of the of the slide that uh, Sue has, it's an image of uh, what I thought worked better in my situation is as I'm conducting the multi head. Um, you know I'm I'm still looking at the microscope the way I, I I'm used to. Um, and then on the right hand side, I put the, uh, the, the, the adapter on the right, right head. 
And that way it's easier for me to talk, uh, navigate um, the slides um, and, and, and show them at the same time. So there's probably no right or wrong way to do it, um, but that's one approach uh, to, uh, to very quickly set up your, uh, your multi-head, virtual multi-head learning um, uh, uh, environment. Sue, so can I That's jump in? Sure. Uh, yes. So, Paul, just to uh, build on your point, about five days ago, uh, news came out that there is um, the digital Zoom technology of s current cell phones is improving very, very fast. And um, a company called Oppo actually just produced a cell phone with a 60x microscope camera attached to it. Literally, not just attached, but as part of the module. So I think in the future, we may have an opportunity, which I think our, even with our small budgets, the schools may be able to actually, you know, say, okay, we'll, we'll pay for that one phone to be able to use this to transmit images as well. Absolutely. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, and just shout out to Christina, who's uh, listening in. She says she also uses telephotology devices for Rose, which works really well. Thank you. And I encourage anyone else who's listening to please um, enter into the chat. Um, at New York Presbyterian, um, we use the, um, oh, and just, just getting back to Paul with that, that um, webcam. So it doesn't work for Android, does it? Is it um, basically set up for the iPhone? The, the one I, I, the adapter I chose is more compatible with iPhone. Although I know mm -hmm. for sure that there are other adapters out there that uh, are more suited to Android as well. You just have well, to That's work. good to know. So we use NYP, at NYP we use um, the Celsons imaging system, which is a really good camera system. And we actually um, hook that up to WebEx or Zoom, um, two platforms, and we can um, transmit images to um, different locations. We can have a lecture, a slide seminar, and people can be at their desktop and um, watching it. Um, we really like it. It's a good system. Um, Paul, I think, I mean, Sean, you use the system as well, right? The Celsons? Uh, yeah, Celsons has been a lifesaver. Uh, I just use that for live multi-head sessions after lectures. And um, the key there, the one thing that I was always worried is, are the students actually seeing the features that we want to um, highlight? What I've noticed that on like regular multi-head sessions, I now know that I need to stop and I need to say, does everyone see? And if you don't see, please let me know so that we can, you know, highlight some of the criteria that, you know, you need to understand, uh, even though, you know, but so far the students have been very receptive to the digital format. I mean, and they've been able to see everything really well. That's terrific. Um, and just another note about HIPAA and compliance, I guess I'm in New York, we really focused on this, but you should be. Um, WebEx or Zoom, you want to have, make sure you have a corporate account so that any type of information that's going over is, is um, you know, protected um, for education. So just to um, sum up some of the successes and limitations, so of course there was a lot of it, adaptability, flexibility, and lectures, and were able to be um, performed without any um, problems and perhaps a little bit enhanced, right? Because now you can do them at your own time and they're more flexible. Um, some of the limitations, I think, um, you know, the paper um, had a very small sample size because it was very few students. So it would be really great for, to see, in the, you know, now that the school is done to see how are the students doing, maybe a larger collaborative force of the educational programs can look into this. Um, we'd love to get some of that input. Um, and then we had talked a little bit about the group dynamic. You don't have that, you know, the small groups getting together. You don't have that camaraderie. You don't have the questions that happen in between learning. Um, it's very important. And again, the networking is, is crucial. So that, that kind of is kind of missed in this online teaching. Um, however, I think in the future, we probably do see a role for hybrid teaching so that you know, we can meet the needs and be more flexible for the modern day students and pandemic and being health conscious as well. Um, and then once we go on to online digital screening, I think it would be an easier um, to fix. Um, traditional screening at the microscope was probably a big challenge. And I don't know if both of you can talk a little bit about briefly 
how your students do with that that part of the um, learning. I know I know you couldn't rotate, which was the shape. Paul. Uh, Sure. Well, we, we actually um, was able to work rotation into our uh, our pro program. We're a master's program, um, and so we have a little bit more flexibility. Our um, our length of study is a little bit longer than one year. It's about a year and a half, and so we we have a little more flexibility. Um, so we we were able to kind of um, switch things around a little bit um, to until the point where. Um, you know, things are a little bit uh, uh, more calm um, than, than uh, the students were able to rotate, uh, albeit a little bit harder to place because um, because of social distancing requirement. Uh, we can't we can no longer place two students at a time at one institution. We have to um, we have to um, you know do it one at a time. And a, a lot of our uh, institution we usually go with affiliates. Uh, we were unable to um, contact them. Um, but I, I also wanted to, to go back and touch a little bit on what you talked, what you said earlier, um, which is um, the part about the some of the limitations um, of remote teaching. Um, remote teaching, really, I, I think it's it's more of a way to complement um, the traditional model. Um, Side of technology has always been a sort of apprenticeship approach to learning, where um, one a, a new person, a new uh, Person to the to the trade uh, follow someone who is well versed uh, with what he, he or she is doing, um, and 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 follow the person around. And, and as situations uh, and issues come up, um, um, he he or she learn um, from from how 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 best to approach these things, um, whether it be professionalism, ethical conduct, attitudes, and these things are potentially lost if you sort of just you know, went all remote. Um, and so it, it's, it, you know, it's remote teaching is not really, I think, um, um, a, a, an approach that would replace traditional model. And, and in a, additionally, um, what you mentioned earlier about networking, um, which is, you know, which is sort of the, 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 the bread and butter or the, the essence of, of, of a lot of times, you know, why we go to school. I mean, of course, we go to school to learn. Don't get me wrong, but but networking is important. I mean, uh, we we all find jobs through you know relationships, people we know. Um, I in fact, I kept in touch today with people that I I went to school with, um, and and they've proven you know invaluable to my uh, uh, to my uh, career advancement, to you know to um, giving me uh, wise and sage advice. Yes, that's great. And um, just um, really briefly, um, I really enjoyed your paper when you talked about the exams and the self-assessments. I don't know if Sean, if you did the same thing, but you know the questions were timed. They had to they had to tap into their phone with answers. I think I would have had anxiety doing that. How did how did that how did the self-assessment and the testing work for you? Um, and Paul, how did how did you find that with the students? Um, well, the idea was that you, you know, with a lot of time, um, the students could text one another. They could um, they could um, find ways to um, to go around the system, and that's why you know, it, by making them <laughs> making them busy and then shortening the amount of time <laughs> on recall related questions, um, you know, they have less time and you know to cheat. Um, I've, I, I'm sure you know th this. That was back in March and April. I'm sure now there are a lot of really, really great ideas that doesn't involve um, la la laborious mm -hmm. work. Um, so, so maybe Sean can speak to that. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, a few things um, before I step away. Uh, I think that online learning really requires organization. I think it's not. I think. You know, I actually took a course on administering an online class, and one of the things they said is that you, sh you know, you want to keep students busy and engaged, but you have to make them think about the coursework and to and 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 give them, you know, um, solid goals with solid criteria for how to assess those goals. All right, so I have been utilizing Blackboard a lot more 
uh, assigning more virtual assignments, even short, low pressure assignments that might be due Saturday night, you know, where the students have time to think about it. Or I give them assignments where their job is to engage. They actually get credit based on the level of engagement they have with their classmates. And uh, in terms of administering exams, I mean, I guess I'm a little old school. And what I tell the students, I was like, if you cheat, you're cheating yourselves. However, we do have lockdown software, lockdown browsers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I think our students are usually scared into knowing that the things that we learn and we need to be able to say, usually we have to know them on the spot and we're not. So regardless of the grade that they earn, it's important that when you're on a rose or you're in a procedure that you don't kind of skip the process so that, you know, you are not caught you know, not knowing the appropriate information or clinical information when you need it most. So generally they don't want to <laughs> even go that route. So. Well, I know you have to go, Sean. Thank you so much for participating. And um, thank you again for keeping your program going and offering suggestions. I'm sure people can reach out to you guys. Um, I appreciate you uh, participating. Um, I don't see any more questions on the chat. Um, clearly, um, in terms of the um, on-site um, cytology education, even though they weren't able to meet in person, the, con the educational objectives and everything was able to continue with very, relatively low-cost technology. Um, and in my opinion, that's a few hybrid learning strategies may offer flexibility and improve learning options and outcomes, and it may attract students in the future to our field and also preparing them to have facilitator and diagnostic skills and actually preparing us for the digital future. Um, uh, do you have any closing comments, John, before you take off? Absolutely. Um, everyone be introspective and be willing to change. I think that was the most important uh, message we got through this pandemic because no one could ever have imagined this happening. But I think that our ability to adopt and adjust truly, you know, is going to be uh, something that we can use as, as a template for the future. And thank you. And Paul, any closing remarks? Sure. I, I just wanted to, um, to say that I think we're, as a collective, more creative and more innovative than, you know, what we um, usually give our self credits for. And um, we're very resilient. And, and you know, we've, we've done a pretty good job. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. And thank you. Stay safe, everybody. I don't see any questions on the chat. Um, I think um, this was a great presentation. I, we'd love your feedback to see whether you like this format of teaching. Um, it's a little bit podcasty like, <laughs> a little different. So um, it's going up on YouTube, social media. So thank you, everybody. Thank you again for continuing the educational program. And Katie, do you have anything to say or? No, I just wanted to say thank you very much for all of your collective experiences that you shared and um, uh, I enjoyed it and it's it's not only relating to the you know your school and the cytology profession in general but for everything else I think a lot of us uh, are seeing it more and more and I agree with you Susan that hybrid probably is the way to go even though I'm an old-fashioned and I like my, my my hand on the microscope and I usually laugh and I say I think my fingers also tell me what this slide <laughs> tells me so but uh, having said that I'm very amazed with all of the technological advances in how we see the pictures how we see the you know real-time uh, screening of the slides when when somebody is unfrozen right now we can see it somebody calls me and I just turn in my camera and go through the software and all I'm there and I can see it very well actually so I think uh, it uh, maybe the necessity made it much better for the invention of better and more updated versions of whatever we have been doing so um, but I, I think and we I think we can learn also from how the schools are doing because my daughter being a senior in high school this year was really a roller coaster but uh, I think she actually learned quite a bit and it it had to do with the preparation of the school and uh, the um, you know the will of the school administration to kind of work with it so and I think that's what you guys shown that you worked with whatever you had and it actually worked out pretty well 
So uh, I thank you, thank you. Uh, for, for your, um, you know, sharing your experience with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, you guys. Bye. Bye.